Thanks for coming. Um, thanks to the organizers. Um, you have come to the Zionism panel. Um, we have really interesting um, papers today, and we're going to interesting papers and an interesting group of people that come from kind of different um, backgrounds. So I'm going to introduce them, and then we're going to hear the papers, and then dive into some uh, serious, hopefully fruitful discussion. Um, so. Um, John C. Howley um, is presenting a paper titled Strategic Essentialism and Class Warfare, Evangelical Christians as Analogy. Um, he is a professor of English and chair of the department at Santa Clara University. He serves on the Modern Language Association Executive Committee on Postcolonial Studies and has edited 14 books, including Postcolonial Queer and the three volume LGBTQ America Today. Um, our second speaker is Aviva Stahl, and her paper is titled Pinkwashing My Diaspora, LGBTQ Birthright Trips and the Homonationalism That Harkens Back. Um, Aviva grew up in the States, but now lives in London. She recently completed a master's degree of sociology, um, a master's in sociology of race at LSC, and now works for Cage Prisoners, a Muslim human rights NGO committed to defending the due process rights of detainees of um, the detainees of the war on terror. This week, she launched um, Renounce Birthright, a web-based resource which aims to mobilize young Jews to call for an end to the Tigli Birthright program. At the end of this, you should all Google um, Denounce Birthright and see the website. Um, our third speaker, Brooke Lo Lober, is presenting a paper titled From Heteronormative to Homonational, the Gendered Ra Racialization of Jewishness in Zionism. Brooke is a PhD student in Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Arizona. She is interested in the ways that attention to racialized gender and sexuality can illuminate um, critical studies of nation, colonialism, and imperialism. Yossi David is our fourth speaker, and his paper is titled Homonationalism Ethnicity on Zionist Self-Production as a Liberal and Critical Society by Creating the Arab Jews as Others. He is a graduate student at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in the Department of Political Communication. His research examines the meaning of queer theory and communication and public opinion research in an attempt to find the connections between gender and dehumanization of Arab society and culture. And finally, um, Mark's, uh, Mark is our final speaker, and his paper is titled, The Otherings of Zionism and Apartheid, Reflections on Growing Up Gay and Jewish in Apartheid South Africa. Um, and Mark is an award-winning journalist and author from South Africa. He is currently an Open Society Fellow. He received South Africa's top award for non of nonfiction for his book, A Legacy of Liberation. He is currently writing a personal narrative book about memory and identity. His journalism has appeared in multiple publications, including the Village the Village Voice in the New York Times, and in 1994, he co-edited Defiant Desire, Gay and Lesbian Lives in South Africa. Mark has been active as a writer, curator, and activist in the anti-apartheid, HIV, AIDS, and LGBT rights movement since the 1980s. So let's welcome all of them. We're going to have more questions later, but just before you start, I collect these pictures just for fun. Um, these are some pictures of like what homonationalism and pinkwashing looks like in Israel. We're not going to talk about them now. You can, we can ask questions or talk about them later. But this is one um, in the Pride Parade. This is an initiative in, from here in the U.S. Um, this is, I'm sure many of you have seen this before. This is um, at the Pride Parade in Tel Aviv. And this is maybe my favorite. Um, <laughs> I'll just leave you with that. Um, and um, so John is going to be our first speaker. I know, thank you. I wish I had known it was a costume party. <laughs> well, it's a great honor to be here, uh, and uh, it's wonderful to have a conference on this topic, which is so interdisciplinary. 
So this is just a little uh, intro to Anne's, mostly stuff that I'm sure that you all are familiar with and have your own strong opinions about. The concept of strategic essentialism is a strategic use of positivist essentialism in a scrupulously visible political context or a political interest. And Dietrich Spivak initially found it a helpful shorthand for the complex relationships between otherwise quite dissimilar groups that shared marginalized positions in their society. I use it ironically here to underscore what otherwise might be described as a form of hypocrisy in the case of evangelical Christian valorization of Zionist aims, or as regressive amnesia or co-optation in the case of American gays who are happy to join political movements that heretofore ignored or mocked LGBT aims if, in joining such groups, they might be admitted to the white bread normalcy of picket-fenced homes in suburbia. One thinks of log cabin Republicans, for example, and in so doing cannot help but note the discomfort that the larger Republican base has generally expressed at the prospect of this pink fringe around their gray toned garment. One wonders in much the same way at the reception Israeli politicians might offer the evangelical Christians in their midst, one using the other for vastly different aims. As the political focus of assimilationist gays and lesbians increasingly mirrors a broader spectrum of non-progressive causes, its multiple complicities echo and sometimes overlap with analogous essentializing movements. The Gay Christian Movement Watch defines itself as a blog upholding biblical standards of sexuality, committed to pressing for the re-education of the church on its ineffective mom and pop approach to Sodom's sexually aggressive spiritual descendants. Those are its words. It is especially vigilant against the so-called gospel of inclusion, that is, that only the consistently wicked will go to hell, and what they describe as pro-gay theology. More progressive counter-movements like the Gay Christian Network on the other hand, give the lie to all such strategic essentialisms and invite queers of all classes, ethnic backgrounds, and nationalities to take stock of what it is that brings them together, if anything. Even this moderate group, though, is tentative in its response to those represented by the Gay Christian Movement Watch, arguing on its website over whether gay marriage should be allowed or whether gays are in fact called to lives of celibacy. The self-confident proclamation from evangelicals who claim to find anti-gay standards of sexuality in the Bible, principally in the Torah, undergirds the theodicy that seeks in Uganda to promote the actual elimination of gay bodies from society, inflamed principally by Uganda's Family Life Network and encouraged by the family a secretive American evangelical organization. Meanwhile, the Christian Zionist movement ironically seeks to bring about the destruction of Israel by supporting its Zionist agenda and thereby inviting Armageddon and the initiation of end times. The presumably naive entry by evangelical Christianity into Israeli politics, where it can be cynically manipulated for Zionist aims, an unnerving entry into Ugandan politics, where it can encourage the large-scale murder of gays that it could never propose to accomplish in the United States, makes for unlikely bedfellows in both countries. Jews that it wishes ultimately to convert and incite to war, and Ugandans in whom it has otherwise no particular interest except as surrogates for the slaughter it sorely wishes it could find occasion to incite in the United States. The problem with these strategic alliances, of course, is that they are artificial. African Americans don't think alike, gays and lesbians don't think alike, Christians don't, nor do Jews or Israelis. As Jonathan Turley writes, quote, contrary to the opinion of many, 
Jews are far from being a hom homogenous ethnicity or religion. One cannot, for instance, refer to being an Orthodox Jew with any precision of description, since that movement is in itself splintered on many details of interpretation." Unquote. The complexities of these tenuously interlocking essentialist coalitions is nicely indicated in the opening of Rachel Tab Tabachnik's essay in Public Eye called The New Christian Zionism and the Jews, A Love-Hate Relationship. She writes, in late October, Holocaust survival, uh, survivor and Nobel Peace Laureate Elie Wiesel spoke at a Christians United for Israel event hosted by the controversial Christian Zionist John Hagee at his Cornerstone Church in San Antonio, Texas. Internationally broadcast on God TV, Hagee presented $9 million in donations to 29 Israeli and U.S. Jewish organizations. Hagee is one of the world's most successful televangelists and a prolific author who prophesies that apocalyptic wars and the migration of Jews to the Holy Land will help trigger the return of Jesus and his thousand year reign on earth. Wiesel joins a long list of Jews and Israelis who show no discomfort at being in the, corn in the center of someone else's apocalyptic religious vision. Making common cause with Christian Zionists are the lobby group American Israel Political Action Committee, which hosted Hagee as a conference keynote speaker in 2007, and Israeli ambassador Michael Oren, who attended a Kufi summit last July. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, a very different kind of pro-Israel gathering was taking place. J Street, the pro-peace, pro-Israel lobby group, was holding its first national conference with panels featuring American, Israeli, and Palestinian speakers. Hundreds gathered in the ballroom of the Washington, D.C. Grand Hyatt for the conference, whose program explicitly stated that J Street aims to challenge, quote, right-wing Christian Zionists, unquote, the very people Bizel was addressing. J Street's leaders are not the first in the Jewish community to resist the embrace of Christian Zionism. Rabbi Eric Yofi of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism has stated that an alliance with Christian Zionists must be rejected for the sake of Israel. Still, there has been little education in the, Je in the Jewish community on the precise nature of these dangers. Indeed, some Jews may avoid publicly criticizing Christian Zionists out of concern that it would damage interfaith relations, though Christians show no hesitation in criticizing Hagee. Others, including a few questioned at the J Street Conference, say Christian Zionist beliefs are of absolutely no interest to them. That's basically uh, all from Rachel's uh, article. In responding to this article, Jonathan Turley underscores the political logic that unites the players. Quote, the aims of the current Israeli government date back to the founding of the Likud party and Menachem Begin. This party skewed Israel away from its original heritage and moved it towards a more nationalistic stance which also was one embracing a philosophy that was economically and politically conservative. They actively sought and received the support of the more extreme elements of Jewish orthodoxy that, except for the crucial issue of Jesus, are philosophically akin to Christian fundamentalists. In my opinion, this is Turley, Likud's rise to power reflects the same kind of public attitude that also brings Republicans to power in the US. That is a false perception of strength through militancy and an economic system favoring corporate interests disguised as freedom." Unquote. The Christian evangelicals who support the building of settlements and the agenda that makes a two-state solution impossible are for the existence of Israel only up until Armageddon, and then God help those Jews who don't see the light and convert. Given the views of these Christian fundamentalists, a peaceful solution would be a terrible idea in their minds, and it would delay God's plan. As Tabachnik points out, camouflaged in love and an exuberant support for Israel, Hagee and other Christian Zionists openly teach narratives that parallel the story lives of overt anti-Semitism in which Jews are portrayed not as ordinary people, but as superhuman or subhuman. From Argentina to Ukraine, so-called pro-Israel groups are singing in Hebrew 
to the same popular messianic melodies, dressing in similar costumes and waving similar flags. It is increasingly difficult to tell if the participants are Christian Zionists or Messianic Jews. Unquote. It is difficult to wrap one's mind around a politics that can, on one hand, embrace the Zionist zealotry of certain evangelical Christians, often those who would encourage the persecution of gays in Africa, and on the other hand, tout the great freedom afforded gays and lesbians in Israel, apparently the best of all possible worlds. One may for be forgiven, I hope, for thinking of the universally offensive films of Sacha Baron Cohen, especially that name for the character of Bruno Gayhart, who brings his flamboyant fashion sense to Jerusalem and meets with little support from the local religious establishment. Perhaps he needed to find a more homogenous gay enclave played in the city, a place more ghettoized than the great mix of peoples and opinions that more accurately characterizes Israel. The juxtapositioning by the government is somewhat unbothering. The warm embrace of the evangelical Christian movements that support Zionist politics on the one hand, and the marketing of Israel as the Middle Eastern haven for the gay community. Those who describe the latter as pinkwashing, the creation of a distraction to cover the massive injustices perpetrated against the Palestinian community, will often also acknowledge that the rights of gays and lesbians in Israel have made strides over the years. At the same time, they will warn gays and lesbians that they may be propping up a system of injustice against this other community, the Palestinians, with whom most might not readily acknowledge a strategic essentialism. If they don't, this is an indication of how assimilated they themselves have become into a cozy world that offers all sorts of reasons for leaving the ghetto and becoming like everybody else, that is, complicit. Before I begin, this is all kind of very preliminary, uh, my preliminary thoughts on this. I'm planning to do a lot of interviews, like when this group of people get back from the trip, from like the next upcoming birthright trip, to sort of find out more. Um, some other preliminary things. Oh, right, I'm not an academic, really. I'm more of a, like, practitioner. <laughs> so <laughs> this might not be as, like, academic as some of the other papers here. But anyway. So yeah, pinkwashing my diaspora, LGBTQ birthright trips, and home nationals in the country. Mm -hmm. What I hope to explore. First, do LGBT and birthright trips pig wash? Oh, by the way, if I speak too fast, just uh, slow down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> oh, sorry. Being yeah. Yeah. Sure. sorry. Secondly, um, how do we resist the co-option of queer diasporic Jews into the pink washing project? And then third, a little bit of like self-promotion. Like the, I want to talk a bit about the Browns birthright project. Mm -hmm. Cool. So do they pig wash? <laughs> So does everyone here familiar with birthright? Yeah. So, okay. I guess I'm just going to talk a bit about birthright to start with. So birthright grew out of this sort of sense, this quote crisis of continuity in the, the diaspora Jewish community, like predominantly in the U.S. in the '90s. Um, so the sense that there was a lack of clearly defined political agendas. So quote, Soviet, the Soviet Jewry had been freed, the Holocaust had been memorialized, and barriers to American Jewish advan advancement had largely been eliminated. Um, there was a lot of sort of research done on intermarriage rates and how religious uh, Jews were, and there was just a, a general sense that Jews were afraid that everyone was going to assimilate, um, and that that was sort of the fear that that birthright grew out of. Um, so, what is birthright? Um, it's a ten-day trip to Israel for youth eighteen to twenty-six. I think you have to be like a, at least a quarter Jewish to attend. Um, and since 2000, um, about 300,000, a little over 300,000 Jews have gone. And if they continue attending court right, uh, the right they currently are, um, within a decade, one in every two young Jewish adults would participate. So that's according to birthright themselves. Um, so I think something really important to look at that I'm really interested in, in looking at is um, the sort of language that birthright uses. So 
the part we read at the beginning, we believe that the experience of a trip to Israel is a building block of Jewish identity, what, what that means and how that's tied to sort of Zionist ideals. And then lastly, the idea of providing the gift of a trip to Israel was initially endorsed by the philanthropists Charles Bronfman and Michael Steinhardt, who shared the belief that it was the birthright of all young Jews to be able to visit their ancestral homeland. So I guess I'm starting from the position that the notion of a birthright is colonialist and racist, and it's like inherently tied to the sort of racist citizenship laws, the right of return, all of those things. Uh, there's nothing like redeemable about the idea of a birthright, basically. Um, Birthrights, this is just briefly, birthrights grounded in the sort of Zionist practice of Teul. So the idea that like, you know, when they were trying to craft the craft an Israeli identity, that knowing the land, hiking, the sort of emotional ties that you create with people when you're like getting to know the landscape, that that would lead to a love of the country. Um, and of course that comes with like particular kinds of gendered Zionist practices that I'm sure other people on the panel will speak to. Um, uh, birthright and the occupation. Okay. Um, what to talk about. Um, so I think it's also important just to acknowledge that birthright, the, the, at least when birthright, the, the people who run birthright say that they, they don't want the leaders to sort of stifle dissent. If you, if you start from the basic position that you accept that Israel, that Jews have a right to a nation, then other kinds of uh, uh, critiques are encouraged. But um, I guess sort of my position also is that um, um, the notion that like there that uh, we could be quote willing to dialogue means that people walk away from the trip feeling like seeing Israel, seeing the sort of diversity of life in Israel, and believing that Israelis are willing to dialogue, and seeing Palestinians only in one lens, which is the lens of the conflict. Um, so I think that even though birthright, you know, people say, oh, I'll go be like a voice of reason on birthright, or I went to my birthright trip and it wasn't total propaganda, I think we still have to be critical of the ways that like, Zionism, Zionism is expressed in other ways, even if like debate is allowed. Um, and also, finally, just the end the part of my talking about birthright, um, participating on birthright, like there are ties between like birthright and the occupation. So people visit the Hava factories and the settlements. Um, birthright really brags about the contributions that they make to the Israeli economy, um, funding sources. Uh, I could go into that later if you guys are interested, but obviously it's funded, like, I think a third by the Israeli government itself. And the political aims of the funders. So the CEO of Birthright um, explains uh, that the purpose of Birthright is so that people can go back to anti Zionists on their campuses and say to them, Don't tell me what you saw on CNN, I was there. Um, Okay, so a bit about the allies trips. They were started in 2008, the LGBT allies trips. Um, so I'm just gonna go through some of the promotion now so everybody can get a sense of what it looks like. Um, so if you are LGBT and want to travel with your Jewish peers, come and join Israel. Learn about how the legal system protects gay rights, how the Israeli defense forces do not impose a don't ask and don't tell policy and more. <laughs> um, these are the ones for like the current upcoming trip in LA this May, I think. Um, we're pro homosexual. <laughs> so, as so whereas the other one is sort of, you know, like Israel is a fabulous nature destination, this, you know, it's just sort of a total normalization of what's happening. Um, I want to hold your hand in the Holy Land. <laughs> um, and then I have to show you guys this. This is, um, it's, I think, the worst one. I apologize if anybody really likes this song. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh no, it's just, it. sorry, it's just, they're on a beach in Tel Aviv, there's soldiers dancing, and those are all, those are the gay birthright participants. They are like doing the lip syncing to this sort of, and this is the, the gay birthright participants, so it's sort of like, I don't know, Call Me Baby is in a lot of ways like a gay anthem, I think, and yeah, anyway. Um, where was I? slide. Here. Yeah, two yeah. Okay, the itinerary. Yeah, you meet gay soldiers, you get talks from LGBT groups, all that sort of thing. Um, I think, so something I'm interested in looking at is the themes that emerge from the participants. So this is all taken from the gay birthright website. 
So if you sort of, I'll just read like one or two. Um, for many years, I've been unsure how to fuse my Jewish and LGBT identities. In fact, I wasn't sure that Judaism had a place in my life at all. Um, the second one, more importantly, the LGBT's uh, themed programming gave me a taste of what gay life is in Israel. Though I'd never been to Israel, I'd considered making Aliyah in the past. After going on birthright, that consideration is at the forefront of my mind. Um, and then the, finally, on the rainbow trip, I was able to feel for the first time in my life that I totally belonged to something as a whole individual and not just the person who is Jewish um, or separately as a person who is queer. So, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious if you start from a position that you like think that pinkwashing exists, that like, you know, gay birthright is pinkwashing, right? It's trying to draw like the sort of queer Jewish diaspora into the pinkwashing like, discourse, right? So I think if we, if we all sort of start from that position, the question I am interested in thinking about is how we resist the co-option of uh, Jewish diaspora Jews into the pinkwashing project, and that's kind of um, what really interests me as, in general. <laughs> so I think, for me anyway, you have to start from the position that, um, if you remember the kind of the quotes that I just read out, that LGBT birthright draws on, like I think, a real genuine yearning amongst young LGBT Jews to make sense of their identities and to feel like they can meet people who are like them. Um, but obviously, LGBT birthright trips carry these really multiple and contradictory meanings. So obviously, A, the Jewish communities in the diaspora. Um, so why do LGBT Jews feel like they aren't, uh, they don't have a place in the, in the Jewish community in the diaspora in the US? Um, I mean, I'm guessing it's homophobia. Um, or that there isn't as much of an effort to like, create space for young queer Jews. Uh, second, uh, Zionism, Zionism's ideal of masculinities and femininities. I'm sure other people on the channel can speak to this um, in a more coherent way, but like, what kind of masculinities are idealized? Is it only like a very masculine masculinity? What about more feminine forms of queerness or that sort of thing? And obviously, a progressive queer politic. So the kind of a queer politic that starts from a position of anti-racism and solidarity. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I think from, from my perspective, a lot of people who go on LGBT birthright aren't exposed to those sorts of um, contradictions in gay birthright, and that's a place where queer Jews who, like, want to fight back against gay birthright can, it's like an entry point in some ways. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, our position as queer Jews in the diaspora, I think there's a reason that there's so many queer Jews involved in pinkwashing and stuff. It's because it makes it, it's easier for us to see the kind of contradictions and hypocrisy and the violence of Zionism, but I think also there's a real, like, personal cost for queer Jews who might have already faced stigma for being gay to also come out as anti-Zionist, and I think that's something that's important for us to, like, talk about and at least acknowledge. Um, um, yeah, finally, I think, um, at least for me, um, I'm really interested because, um, you know, as a, uh, growing up in the diaspora, I think we're taught that going to going on birthright is like a central way for us to explore our Jewish identities. I think it's really important for us to think about other ways to cultivate a diasporically centered Jewishness as a way to fight against Zionism. So that can mean like drawing on, like I think, really quite purposely suppressed diaspora histories. So whether it's like the Bund and the Bund's idea of like hearing us and fighting anti-Semitism in the diaspora, um, or Jewish resistance to capitalism and racism from South Africa to the US, um, Jewish life in the East Village and in the East End of London, or like sort of this long history of queer um, anti-racist Jews, like Emma Goldman and Laura Whitebarn, and I'm sure there are others. I guess what I just mean to say that there's, is that there's a history that we're not tapping into um, that could be really meaningful to queer Jews who don't necessarily want to be complicit in, in apartheid, but don't know how else to like go about exploring who they are. Um, so I think one example, I don't know if you guys have seen this um, Pagoda. People use it. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. great. <laughs> so um, it's Love and Justice in Times of War Hagada, and there's the 10 plagues of the occupation, and then the 10 plagues of the occupation on the Jewish people. So if anybody wants the PDF, just like find me afterwards and um, give it to you. <laughs> and then finally, a bit of shameless self promotion. Um, so Renault's Birthright, it was launched this week. There's sort of three aims of the project. The first is to call for an end to the birthright program, to call for like its defunding, basically. The second is to educate young Jews about the connections between birthright trips and the ongoing colonization and occupation of Palestine. Sort of to use birthright as a way to like um, to ask people to interrogate kind of the larger context. Um, and the third is to affirm the importance of Jewish life in the diaspora um, and to try to sort of create a way for queer, like for Jews, both queer and straight, to like find more ways to express being Jewish and to recognize that they don't, it doesn't have to be in the sort of uh, unequal relationship between the diaspora and Israel. Um, so you should all go on the website. 
<laughs> and so basically what we're doing right now um, is we're trying to get as many signatures as possible for an open letter to birth rate. So this is the open letter. I probably don't have time to read it. Um, but it's on the website. Um, and we're also super open to critiques and to like contributions. It's like a very, very young project, obviously. Um, so if anybody wants to get involved, like just come find me. interested in a lot of the stuff that Aviva is doing and I'm, I'm super excited about the projects that you're talking about so I'm excited to be here. Um, I know that I don't need it yet but I will need to get my PowerPoint. Can, you, yeah. can we like maybe not put it up yet because it will like be distracting but yeah. Okay. Is it this one? It is. Should I put it? Okay we can just keep it. Okay I'll tell you one. Oops it's like a little ways through. Okay so um so my paper is called, right now it's called From Heteronormative to Homonational, The Gendered Racialization of Quote-Unquote Jewishness in Zionism. And this is a draft I would love to hear people's responses and suggestions, and it's just a teeny piece of stuff that I'd like to know more about in the future, so hoping to share this kind of preliminary thinking with you. Um, Attention to the representation of Jewish gender and sexuality can illuminate the contemporary production of homonationalism and neo-imperial feminism in the transnational promotion of Zionism. Pinkwashing, the effacement of Israel's international reputation for systematic violence against Palestinian people through the promotion of LGBT rights and tolerance, emerges in relation to LGBT and queer incorporation into neoliberal and neo-imperial projects that Lisa Dugan, Jasmine Poir, Jin Harita Warren, and numerous other scholars have critically shown. Um, the recent brand Israel materials are multifarious enough to offer celebration of racial and ethnic diversity almost as easily as they promote the apartheid wall. But typical Israeli state promotion, both before and since the advent of brand Israel, and it's often liberal rhetoric, just like traditional Hasbara, can be seen as a racially whitening project for Jews in the West, achieved through a concerted effort to invent and disseminate normative notions of Jewish gender and sexuality. The fraught racialization of Jews in Zionism includes consistent sexual normalization, inherent in both historical and current Zionist discourse. From claims of Jewish manliness to claims of Jewish LGBT tolerance, Zionist discourse effaces racialized Jewish sex and gender dissidents, incorporating Jewishness into hegemonic whiteness. In the context of Christian hegemony and white supremacy, this gendered whitening definitively marks Ashkenazi Jews as European and as Western, decidedly not quote unquote oriental as they had been described in Europe for generations. Targeting particular populations and spaces the transnational promotion of Zionism today contributes to the assimilation of Jews into whiteness by making sexually liberal claims that rely on white and Western superiority, a process that reinforces the production of the backwards, oriental, and anti-Semitic Muslim and Arab other. This Ashkenazi-centered project of gendered Jewish racial assimilation in the West produces a racial hierarchy, including a racial structure among Jewish peoples as it marginalizes and degrades Mizrahi history and culture and denies the contemporary reality of Mizrahi subjugation in Israeli society and invisibility or present absence of Mizrahim in Ashkenazi-dominated Jewish culture in the US and transnationally. But as Ashkenazi Jewishness is absorbed into whiteness, the Zionist imposition and circulation of new Jewish sexual and gender norms still resonates with the racialized shame about Ashkenazi culture that this transformation of Jewish gender attempts to resolve. The project to promote Zionism as common sense is al always already inscribed with formulations of racialized gender and sexuality, but gender and sexual representations of Jewishness in Zionism have shifted over time. Um, Daniel, Boyerin's, Daniel Boyerin is a scholar currently at Berkeley, and I'll refer a lot to him in this piece. 
Daniel Sheridan's extensive research into the vicissitudes of Jewish gender provides key tools for analysis of the interplay of race, gender, and sexuality in Zionist promotional materials. Boyerman argues that reacting to the degraded Jewish gender and sexuality inscribed in European anti-Semitism, early Zionists achieved the gendered, goal, the gendered racial goal of, quote, becoming white men, and that's Boyerman, in part through Jewish nationalism and the colonization of Palestine, a project that made claims to the newly imagined Jewish nation and its right to Palestinian land and the, hetero, the heterogender normative Jewish body. As Boyerin shows, Northern European Jewish society from the 18th century onward adopted traditions of homosociality and male femininity that are idealized in the Babylonian Talmud. Boyerin's argument illuminates the production of masculinity and more broadly heteronormative gender roles as a national and racial project with effects on Jewish racialized subjugation in historical Europe and the representation of gender in Jewish nationalism. So Boyerin writes, and I'm going to do a couple big quotes from Boyerin here, so we'll start with this one. So Boyerin writes that traditional Ashkenazi Jewish culture produced a model of masculinity that was openly resistant to and critical of the prevailing ideology of manliness dominant in Europe. The alternative Jewish form of maleness was known as Edelkeit, which literally means nobility, but in Yiddish it means gentleness and delicacy. Its ideal subject was the Yeshiva Bokar, the man devoting his life to the study of Torah, and his secularized younger brother, the Mensch, the good man. Within traditional Ashkenazi Jewish culture, the soft man was a central and dominant cultural ideal, not a marginalized alternative. Boyerin argues that this Ashkenazi, quote, refusal to be a man, developed over time in dynamic relation with the experience of Jewish subordination in Europe and carries significant feminist possibility for the construction of alternative masculinities today. Thus, Boyerin seeks to reclaim, and this is his quote, the sissy, the Jewish male femme, as the location and a critical practice. It is important to understand, however, that the whole of Ashkenazi Jewish gender and sexuality, not just male roles, were challenging to the dominant Christian culture for several centuries, preceding the cataclysmic changes that took place during the fin de siècle. Boyerin writes, as significant as the different gendering of Jewish men was, so there was a significant difference in the gendering of Jewish women. While their men were sitting indoors and studying Torah, speaking only a Jewish language and withdrawn from the world, women of the same class were speaking, reading, and writing the vernacular, maintaining businesses large and small, and dealing with the wide world of tax collectors and irate customers. In short, they were engaged in what must have seemed to many in the larger culture as masculine activities, and if the men were read as sissies, the women were read often enough as phallic monsters. While Ashkenazi gender ideals came under increasing pressure from the dominant European culture, one response to such negative characterization was the reinvention of Jewish masculinity through the regenerative ideal of the new Jew or the muscle Jew, itself an extension of centuries of discourse on regeneration in Europe and a mimicry of the ideal of the muscular Christian. So we can probably put up the first slide, if that's okay. Um, the ideal, and I'll, I'll just talk, we'll put up the image and I'll talk about it for a minute. Um, the ideal of the muscle Jew, popularized at the Second Zionist Congress by Max Nordau in 1898, shows the gendered politics of the body in the Zionist call for Jewish racial regeneration. Todd Kressner, in his book Muscular Judaism, which came out in 2007 and is like extremely valuable for thinking about muscle Jews and muscular Judaism, it's very detailed, a wonderful cultural studies piece, um, in his book, Muscular Judaism, he argues that while both female and male muscle Jews were produced at the height of this discourse, and the politics of regeneration applied to both men and women, the ideal of the muscle Jew is decidedly masculinist. This figure illustrates the heteronormative gender order for Jews imposed as a, a racial project in the, the masculinity, the proper masculinity of Zionism. Presner argues that the ideal of the muscle Jew remained consistent throughout the 20th century and was reflected in the body of the Israeli soldier, celebrated especially after the 1967 war. So Presner actually compares these two images. One is from the cover of a publication of Herzl's Bald New Land, published in 1904, and the other is from the cover of Life magazine, published after the 1967 war. Both images represent a resolution to anti-Semitism in Europe through the production of the muscular male body, overtly responding to the discourse of gendered inferiority <coughs> imposed upon Jews in the modern West with a nationalist masculinity in the body of the new Jew. And we could look at anti-Semitic imagery that shows um, the body of the weak and feminine male Jew. I'm not gonna do that today, but it's definitely done um, in Kressner's work and in Boyerin's work. If classic, Euro so 
You've seen them. These are, you know, muscle men. They're like Greek gods. Um, and they're bringing the fertility of the grapes to the promised land. And Presner actually talks about that as, as, a, as also a homoerotic image, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, if classic European anti-Semitism characterized the Jew, meaning the male Jew in his androcentric discourse, as weak, effeminate, and otherwise queer, and characterized the less discussed Jewess as dominant or masculine, early Zionists agreed with this gender assessment of Jewish race in anti-Semitic Europe, and this agreement remains today. The stereotypes circulated about Jewish gender are not, as Boyerin has shown, arbitrary fictions. Rather, they are white supremacist, heteropatriarchal characterizations of Ashkenazi and, more broadly, Jewish gender ideals. Historical stereotypes of queer Jews were indications of the dissonance between the heteropatriarchal culture of Romantic Europe and the queerly gendered but also patriarchal and heterosexually reproductive Ashkenazi society. In response to this degradation, European Jewish nationalists complied with the dominant culture. Zionism proposed a normative gender order for European Jews, the imposition of which carried with it an assimilation of Jewish Europeans into the white supremacist world order, a racial project enacted through the colonization of Palestine and the concomitant normalization of Jews in the West. But the masculinist formation of Jewish ethnicity proposed in 20th century Zionist, Zionism, while still resonant today in current representations of Israeli military might, makes some new sexual claims um, currently in order to portray Israel as a first world liberal democracy. The historical production of Jewish masculinity and Zionism is consistent with contemporary articulations of feminism and LGBT rights with Islamophobia and Israeli state nationalism, or pinkwashing, because both discourses are racially normalizing. Both normative masculinity and sexual tolerance have the power to make Jews white in the West. This common ground between sexual tolerance and racist state building is apparent in current brand Israel materials, and I'm, I'm gonna show a couple now. Um, they're much more crude, actually, than the, than the material that, that we just saw. So forgive me, this is a little easy. But um, I'm going to talk about two California-based, self-described Israel advocacy groups. Um, and these groups form part of the new Israeli state investment in renewing and rebranding the image of Israel internationally. These groups produce PR that denies Israeli apartheid, declares the multiculturalism of Israeli society, promotes environmentally efficient technologies and other cutting edge technologies produced by Israelis, sensationalizes Palestinian terrorism, and advertises the rights of women and gays in Israel. The connecting links between all these is the discursive articulation of the state of Israel, the US and Europe, and the global war on terror, as well as in cultural superiority over the Arab and Muslim world. And the notion that, in a related way, the state of Israel is not traditional, old, and backwards, like supposedly Arab and Muslim states, but rather that Israel is modern, new, hip, and cutting edge, and that because of all this, Jewish people transnationally are normative, even exemplary Western subjects. So let's let's look at the next slide. Um, I'm sorry, you did it just like that? Okay. So these two posters you may have seen before. Activists have been taking a look at them for a while. They were created by the San Francisco-based group Blue Star PR, and they could be downloaded from their website. And I really think that that's a part of this, that these materials are accessible and downloadable. People are encouraged to use them in their community. So these posters, um, these posters convey the racial inferiority of the Arab and Muslim, Arab or Muslim other through, um, Arab and or Muslim other through liberal equality discourse. Both the vintage image of the beautiful soldier boy and the diverse group of girl power friends <laughs> serve to reinforce the binary That's narrative. So <laughs> the, they serve to reinforce the binary narrative that opposes the monolithically patriarchal, homophobic, and barbaric Muslim and Arab world to the state of Israel as part of the liberal, democratic, gay, and woman friendly West confronted by hostile neighbors. Such pinkwashing attempts to harness LGBT and in a related way feminist discourse to Zionist hegemony in the realm of common sense through an instantiation of the East-West binary in which Jewish people are Zionist subjects proper to the West. I will show a couple more images that exemplify this trend. So the next two are from Stand With Us. They're in this one with the news obviously is extremely tolerant. Um, so Stand With Us talks about how through print materials, speakers, programs, conferences, missions to Israel campaigns, focus on social media and internet resources, we ensure the story of Israel's achievements and ongoing challenges is told on campuses and communities and media libraries. But my point is that they, they're based in LA and they, they have 15 offices across the US as well as a couple other places. So this is definitely like a US-based um, version of this discourse. 
This political pinkwashing maneuver follows in the wake of an articulation between empire and liberal notions of gender and sexuality that predate the turn of the 21st century, but are strengthened in post 9-11 homo-nationalism, the contemporary construction of normative sexual subjects, including exceptionally some gays and lesbians, who take on privileged places in the generation of a nation at the cost of the reinscription of other queer others. The pinkwashing and women's rights discourses that we see crudely represented in these images, they play a key role in the reproduction of Zionism's legal commitments, but they appear in just a small fraction of the materials used to promote Zionism transnationally. Much more promotion of Israel, in no direct contradiction to pinkwashing discourse, and no, no contradiction at all, um, it, much more promotion of Israel directly focuses on the notion of Zionism as a necessary structure for Jewish survival and reinforces the US and Western um, partnership with Israel in the war on terror. While relying on liberal equality discourse, Zionism promotion in the brand Israel era nonetheless reinscribes and maintains a gendered binary opposition between the notion of feminized Jewish vulnerability to religious and racial hate resulting in violence against Jews and the masculine quote unquote strength and safety produced by Jewish nationalism in the form of the militarized Israeli state. The masculinist production of Jewish gender, which discursively facilitates Israeli military power, is retained, even in Israel's newly branded liberal feminist and LGBT image. So I'm gonna end with a new poster and just talk about it a tiny bit. And this, um, this poster was just put up on the Stand With Us website, and I know it's gross, so let's just talk about it for a second, and we can process. But um, this says, Am Yisrael Chai, and that means the nation of Israel lives. Um, and this image was ostensibly produced to celebrate a numerical milestone in Israeli Jewish population growth, um, just like re very recently. And it demonstrates the resonance of Jewish gender shame around masculine norms today, with the transition between weak, feminized male prisoners in the Nazi camp to the obvious resolution in the militarized masculinity of the soldiers. An interesting point about this image is that Stand With Us probably produced it in error. As Noam Shaisoff of 972 Magazine just pointed out, the Buchenwald prisoners who we see here were probably not classified as Jews. They wear the single triangle assigned to political dissidents, the mentally ill, and homosexuals. Yeah. All these figures are associated and after that article came out, actually, Stand With Us took it down off their Facebook page, so they'll probably redo it. You can take a look. Um, but so they wear the single triangle, right? Um, associated with political distance, the mentally ill, and homosexuals. All these figures are associated, especially in, in anti-Semitism, Jews um, in the West. But the only Jews we see here are the contemporary male IDF soldiers. So I'll just end with a long quote from Todd Presner. While the associated ideals of muscularity and masculinity have certainly become internalized as part and parcel of Israeli identity, they've also come to define a more widespread contemporary mode of being Jewish in the world, one which is characterized by toughness, aggressiveness, and battle readiness. After World War II and the Holocaust, the generation of Jews growing up in Israel and the United States has been weaned on this ideology of muscle. Never again, we are told, will Jews go like lamb to slaughter? Never again, we are told, can we let down our guard. The image of the combat-ready, gun-toting warrior has come to replace of the bookish intellectual or the gentle shlemiel. The image of the Yiddish-speaking Jew of the Eastern European shuttle has become supplanted by the Hebrew-speaking Sabra Jew, who is always prepared to fend off worthy attackers and secure the perimeters of his land. To, 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 uh, to assumptions uh, to bring it to, to, to this 
and play some assumption that I think that it should to be when I speak and how do I speak. The first one is that Israel is a settler colonialism state and Zionism is a colonial agenda. The second is the uh, have no essentialism uh, identity, uh, just politi uh, politically identity. And the third is the I speak and what I told here is will be about the whiteness and blackness and not about the identity, about people, someone. Uh, when is, the Ashkenazi Zionism created the Arab Jewish, what the, you call the Mizrahim, uh, and known as the Mizrahim, as the others. On all the uh, implication and objects for all the production, the self, uh, uh, the self of the Ashkenazim as a liberal and enlightenment. Yes. And I have a lot of uh, uh, resources to speak about this, like Azum and Gilman. According to Shenar, Arab Jews were, produ were produced as a, religion, uh, as a religious in order to deny their Arabness or color. And I argue that they, that they transformation of them to religion people deny them the option to have morality. That is to say Zionist Ashkenazism, maybe you should say, created Jewish from Arab countries as immoral people, whose job is to carry out the dirty work as those, as those who have no right to exist except as a canon folder and as a someone that do the guilty work for the European colonizer. The Ashkenazi, as such the Jewish Arab, are nothing but object in service of the Ashkenazi Zionism. And so they are used also to brand the Ashkenazi as a, as a liberal uh, by making Jewish Arab as immoral. People of color and religion people are the ultimate of the others in white and secular society. And therefore, values that are defined as religion or as significant of religion will be considered as a negative and immoral, and thus rejected, producing the beginning of self as a liberal is graduate uh, Israeli propaganda policy. And of course, it's... The pinkwashing is a part from the creating the uh, Ashkenazi uh, liberal movement, uh, but washing of our the Ashkenazi society, they are part from the liberal society. This is... Uh, trying to create the Ashkenazi Zionism self as a liberal Zionist that keep the white Western values like human rights as a tool to carry out the operation of others like Arabs and Palestinians. An Arab Jews is a hybrid comparison of the East and the West. So he is a colonizer and a colonizer together. That is a both and not all one or another. It's like mayonnaise made of two elements that you cannot separate. The Arab Jewish, the Arab Jewish being under, uh, undermines the dichotomy of the Zionism created between the Jewish and Arabs. A Totally, that served the goals of Zionism to justify settled colonialism that was done in its name. One way of Ashkenazi Zionism to delete the existence of the Arabs, the Palestinians in our case, is Zion's, in Zion, is by cancelling 
identity of Jewish from Arab countries as Arab Jewish. This delating allowed producing two important elements of base of the justification of Zionism. First, to make the Arabs a nation and not an ethnicity. Second, creating the Judaism as a nationality and not as a religion. The Zionism discourse erased the Palestinian rights to the land because they are part of the Arab nation and has been state or states for this nation. And at the same time, to do the, the, the legitimacy of the Jewish state because Judaism is a nation without a land. Dismantling and the decolonization of the Israeli Zionist society and the concept that constitute and produce the power of whiteness towards cell production as a colonist and a colonization at least. This value of whiteness and blackness are not necessarily related to ethnicity or color. Also, is it often connection between of them. Pinkwashing is not something that belongs to white people, but rather to whitenesses and that was presenting white ideas and white thinking, which often present colonizer more than colonized. To be an Arab Jewish in Israel is to be the colonizer and the colonized simultaneously. To be under occupation and enjoy it. To be a problem as Arab and a solution as a Jewish. In the Israeli case, we can see that in the 30s and 40s, when homosexuality were forbidden uh, morality, he was considered as Orientalist disease, which were brought by members of the Orient, Jewish and non-Jewish, and seen as the Orient illness, Oriental illness, uh, that we have to protect the society from her. Uh, and a long historical work by Ophelani about this. Uh, today, in the 21st century, on the, on the one hand, homosexuality received recognition and has become legit, legitimate, and, and on the other end, homophobic, homophobia is considered to be immoral, as, as surprisingly, and in the same time, homophobia is actually become to be a problem of the Orient people. The, the Jewish and the not Jewish in Israel. This, despite a few uh, research uh, researchers that found the Arab Jewish except LGBT family member more, more than Ashkenazi families, and there is mm -hmm. academic and activist writing on the problem of the definition of sexual orientation in the right frame, so, such as homosexuality and all the LGBT. To make, to make the point clear, we can summarize the idea of homo-nationalism in one sentence. While in the past people used in the argument of national liberalism to justify the operation of other based on sexual orientation, today people use in argument of liberalization of sexual orientation in order to justify the operation of national minorities. Meaning, the, the morality of modern society is based on values of whiteness, whitenesses. And therefore, what is moral is what legitimate and is based on the values of the whitenesses. And what is immoral and who is illegitimate, illegitimate defined based on these values. The homo-nationalism perspective on the others branded them as a immoral, evil, and primitive. The other defined as a strange announcement. Announced it. That's why immigration and terror is not related to image but imagination.
That is a visa colonial agenda. In Israel today is a settler colonialist country, and such as in is contains the characteristic of type of colonialism. Israel sees the natives as inhuman, inhuman and make dehumanization to them. It is meant and make dehumanization to them is is its main characteristic. And similarly, the oh, closeness to the native immediately marks as a dangerous and therefore request to eliminate it. Walls and fence are one of the ways to deal with this similarity of, of closeness to the native. But elimination of the Arabness and existence of our Jewish is, is a part to deny the colonizer. The colonized is not a human, and because of this, he has no culture, and mother of them is not considered as a Hussein mother. Colonized society values ex exist to maintain the occupation, and such as they change and adapt worldview of that allow its existence, worldview that acceptable in Western white society and confirm the law to occupation. So when the white Western society accepted the others of gender and sexual orientation, the colonial society accepted it, it and began to act in similar way. But accepted of this value most used as a tool to strengthen the, to strengthen the occupation and its legit legitimacy, which is what performed by pinkwashing between verbs. Mark is going to be our last speaker, and then we'll have some Q&A. Hi, everyone. Um, it's very, uh, it's exciting to be here, and it's, it's um, with, the, with every single one of these, of these presentations, I felt like I was learning something, so thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> so don't use the time to be um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I guess where I'm starting with is, is the way Israeli apartheid has become something of a catchphrase, particularly of the left. And I want to perhaps provoke a conversation about what apartheid means uh, as a metaphor. And to do that uh, using, not, not speaking analytically or, or as a scholar, but, but speaking personally, uh, polemically and, and subjectively about my experience is growing up gay and Jewish in apartheid South Africa. Um, and I, I, what I want to do is, is I want to, what, what I came to understand what, in my life and in my childhood was, was Zionism and apartheid uh, as two iterations of the lager. And I'm not sure how many of you know what the lager means. So the lager is the sort of foundation formation of um, apartheid identity of white South African settler identity. The lager was the ring of ox wagons mm -hmm. uh, that the Africa, the Boer pioneers would put themselves, put, put around themselves as they were striking into the hinterland to protect themselves from the dangerous, dark, savage, threatening people beyond. And the lager is absolutely central to white South African identity and was to apartheid identity too. So I'm going to talk about how I came to experience the lager. Um, I come from a secular, liberal, non-Zionist, South African, Jewish Ashkenazi family. And particularly coming after Brooklyn Yossi, I want to talk about what that means in terms of race in South Africa. Uh, my grandparents would have come to South Africa at the end of the 19th century, along with, in the same way that brought so many Jews to other, other places in the New World as part of a process of industrialization, they considered themselves to be European and white. But uh, because of a kind of policies of nativism 
and part of inherent folk ideologies that grew in the early 20th century, uh, Jews in South Africa came to be considered sort of not quite white. And immigration, even though they, they were part of the, the, the white community, there were immigration quotas put upon them as there were on other kind of darkish people coming from Europe. And that all changed in 1948, which was a very important year in South Africa, as it was um, in Palestine, in Israel, uh, because that was the year that um, the National Party was elected into government and began implementing apartheid. And at that point, uh, white, the white Afrikaners who were in power realized they needed all the whites they could get. And Jews moved from being not quite white to being white. They moved sort of very squarely into the lager, uh, which is where they were uh, for the rest of the apartheid era. So it was within that context, from within the lager, even though my family was a liberal family, um, that I was subject to what was in effect a Zionist education masquerading as a Jewish one. And it was through this education that I received Zionism as a form of racial and ethnic supremacism. Um, of course, I was raised as a little white master within a racist society, but I came from a polite home where derogatory words were banned and where there was no theory offered to explain our privilege. And so the first time I heard derogatory words for people who were different and a theory of privilege to accompany it was when I was enrolled in the Jewish school I went to King David in the early 1970s. And there were so many of these derogatory words, it was sort of overwhelming for somebody who'd never thought of calling somebody else something derogatory before. So you might know some of these words, alelum and alelum. Enumerate them for you. There were Schweizers, of course, but there were also Schochs, which was another word for black people. Of course, there were Goyen and there were Shikses. There was a word, Chatesen, which was used for Afrikaners, because we were English-speaking. There was a word, Kulkas, which was used for Asians, no doubt coming from Kulis. And of course, there was also the word Fagler, which I was called by one of my um, Hebrew teachers. And I had been called Fagler already by my grandmother, but in a way that I knew was affectionate. <laughs> um, <laughs> my favorite Fagler. <laughs> it was not affectionate when I was called Fagler by the Hebrew teacher. Um, there might have been gradations amongst these words, but they were all in the same category, the other. And it was here as a white boy growing up in apartheid South Africa, here in my Jewish school, that I first heard articulated a theory of supremacism. To any questions asked about ritual or prayer, why do I have to have a bar mitzvah? Why am I circumcised? Why do I have to lay to fill in? The answer was standard and unvaried, because this is what makes you different from them, because this is what makes you better than them. This was religion as chauvinism rather than metaphysics. And not only did it kill any nascent spirituality in me, but it lodged in me at the very beginnings of my political consciousness, a connection between Zionism and apartheid, as systems which privileged some people over others, long before I knew anything about either the Palestinian or the South African liberation movements. So our school in the 1970s celebrated the special relationship between Israel and South Africa the two pariah states of the late 20th century, led by two sets of chosen people, both of whom were misunderstood prophets in the wilderness. Our South African history textbooks mirrored our Jewish studies ones, brave pioneers fleeing oppression, conquering the wilderness and bringing civilization to the savages, flowers to the desert. I remember that our school closed twice during my primary school years, the first time was during the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973, and the second was during the Soweto Uprising of 1976, uh, the first South African Intifada, if you like. Mm -hmm. There was such a sense of embattlement around both events, of siege, that I, in my mind I can't quite distinguish the one from the other. Both in 73 and 76, we felt personally under attack, the siege. Now, immediately after the 76 uprising, uh, many of my relatives made Aliyah to Israel. Some of these people were brave liberals, 
who believed somewhat blindly that they were moving to a society that they'd learned about in Havoni, the socialist um, youth, Jewish youth movement, Zionist youth movement, where everyone was free and equal according to Zionist socialist ideology. Some definitely were doctrinaire Zionists who wanted to defend the Zionist, the Jewish homeland against the Arabs. But most weren't Zionists at all. They merely carried within them the Jewish genetic code, a nose for trouble and a heightened anxiety about persecution. And so as South Africa seemed set for a bloody civil war, they exercised their right to return. They sought a place of safety in Zion. When I meet them now, only one or two are brave enough to suggest that they might have made the wrong choice, plunging themselves from the frying pan into the fire. But most of them talk with horror about the criminal violence that now racks South Africa. And they speak about how comparatively safe they are in Israel. And it's very interesting because we inevitably land up talking about the war. And many of them will voice their ideological or ethical discomfort with the wall of separation. But they'll all say, and I can't think of one conversation which didn't go this way with my relatives, ex-South African. They'll all say that they admit to feeling a lot safer since the war went up. So it seems to me that they've put themselves in another lager. A lager they sent their children off to defend with increasingly heavy hearts, but with no understanding, no ability to understand that this lager is indefensible, both morally or practically. Like South African apartheid in the 20th century, the Zionism of the Israeli state seems to me to deploy a a toxic admixture of exceptionalism and victimology, both of which I use to justify supremacism. And the whole structure of this deceit, and I know this in my bones because I'm South African, the whole structure of this deceit requires a perpetual enemy against which one must quarrel an ever stronger lager, defended by an ever more lethal arsenal <coughs> than muscular Zionists we just heard of. Once you lose your enemies, you lose your identity. And that is the key defining characteristic of the Lager mentality, whether this calls itself apartheid or Zionism. Now I, and I think many people in this room, choose to define my Jewishness and my South Africanness in a different way. So um, I'm going to, I don't have much time, but any time at all. <laughs> <Should> <laughs> Okay, well, I, well I, was, I was going to talk about um, the queer stuff a little bit, and I was going to talk about how one of the things that apartheid strove to do was to keep Sodom out of the lager. It was about um, not only defining who you were, but who you could sleep with, who you could live with, who you could fuck. And um, one, of the, one of the most important markets of the contemporary South African state, as you all know, is, is that we have this equality, we have this extraordinary constitution, mm -hmm. which outlaws discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a paper being given right now by Alok Vaid Menon that I feel in another panel that you should try and get hold of because he, he, is, he speaks in a very interesting way about um, South African pink washing, which I think we could call rainbow washing. This notion, we can show that we're this rainbow nation because you can put people like me and my husband He's Indian, I'm white, we're married. You can put us on the stage, you can, you can say, look at this extraordinarily tolerant society. Um, and of course, that covers a multitude of problems, uh, not least, as I'm sure you know, the violence that's perpetuated against gender non conforming black men and women from within their own communities. Um, but I guess what, the way I want to conclude is I want to say that um, despite this rainbow washing problem, I think that when it comes to human rights and the protection of sexual minorities, the South African experience offers a valuable lesson to the rest of the world, and particularly to Palestine and Israel. As the society was forced out of its apartheid lager, forced, it must be said, in no small part by the strategies of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, as the walls were broken down, the argument was made that just as people couldn't be denied their rights, because of their race or ethnicity, so too could they not be denied their rights because of their sexual orientation. It was a successful argument, and I believe that out of it emerges a constitution that remains a powerful tool for legal and social change. 
Now, from my experience and my, from my perspective, the Israeli, the Israeli experience seems to have worked in the opposite way. Independent of the struggle for the rights of Palestinian people, a group of brave, they are brave, and effective gay rights activists fought for and won a powerful set of rights for sexual minorities. But having been won, these rights appear to have been instrumentalized as a weapon in Israel's bigger war against the Palestinians, as yet another reason to justify the lager. We need to protect these Western values, which we ascribe to against the savages on the other side of the war. In South Africa, activists like Simon and Cordy and Zaki Ahmed spoke about how their dignity as black people and as queer people were indivisible. Meanwhile, white gay and lesbian activists, and I put myself in this category, proved our credentials and educated our comrades by becoming part of a broader struggle. And I think that those Israeli and Palestinian queer or LGBT activists who act in the same way in the Israeli context, whether they are Israelis who are anti-occupation or Palestinian queer activists such as the people of our cause, are, are doing not only what's right morally, but what's right tactically too. Mm -hmm. And I want to salute them. I think they're playing their part in breaking down the walls of the lager. And from my perspective as a South African, I find this very inspiring. Thank you. So um, I'll propose a little bit of commentary and synthesis and ask each one of you a question. And then we can open it up and you can choose which, which questions you would like to answer. Um, so um, I'll do this both as I go along. So for John's paper, um, I wanted to ask about Internally, do you think do you think that churches or the the BDS um, movement is working together with church groups, and there's sort of like a movement within churches to adopt boycott, divestment, and sanctions? Does that at all interface with um, Christians who oppose Christian Zionism? And what are the conversations that are going on um, in the, specifically within the movements that are that are trying to pass the investment within the churches, um, that's a question. And also, why, um, if we're talking about kind of unlikely bedfellows of of Israel working with organizations like Christian United for Israel, while inside of Israel there's kind of many unlikely alliances as well. So, what, like, why are we going so far? to Christian Zionists in the States when also within Israel there's these kind of um, liberal political parties or organizations that are partnering up with homophobic individuals or organizations. Um, so that's a question for you. Um, for Aviva, do you speak? Um, I was at a conference uh, a few days ago at BU about the, the Palestinian right of return. Um, and one of the speakers talked about um, Jewish identity and also about birthright and he sort of said you know birthright is it exemplifies the crisis of Jewish religious identity in the United States and a different um, friend of mine says like Israel has replaced God in the conversation about Jews in the United States and I'm wondering how you relate to that not just as a, a cultural phenomenon but also as like a um, theological breakdown or something along those lines. Um, and both with John's paper and Aviva's paper, the question of birthright and the Christian Zionist um, powers are tied to massive institutions and sort of how do we, as activists, our funding is tiny and we have so much less power and we're dealing with like breaking down not just, not just one program of birthright, but these huge structures with so much money behind them and, and big institutions. Um, uh, Brooke, um, the question was, you talked about how the, the mensch, this idea of the mensch has changed and now in Israel the ma masculine ideal is like this soldier, weapons, etc. but there is still a self-perception 
of all of the soldiers as being Menches in a way, or still like there's a, a disconnect maybe between the identity of, um, even though it has changed in their minds, maybe it still hasn't, and um, this difference between self-perception and what is actually happening in the world. Um, uh, Yossi, also in the same conference last week, somebody um, talked about uh, Mizrahi Jews in Israel, and I use the word Mizrahi, I don't like to use it, but I don't have a better word to use to describe such a broad category of people. Um, and he made a statement, which I'm, I'm wondering what you think of, that the maybe one of the biggest dangers in for the Zionist establishment in Israel today is that there will be a flip um, amongst the Mizrahi population and like some sort of awakening of a renewed Arab identity or some sort of uh, ch change in the way in a collective perception, how threatening that is and whether or not that still hap it is already happening. Um, and and does that will that or does it have to be separate from solidarity along with Palestinians? Are those separate? Are they the same? Um, something along those lines. And Mark, in your paper, you also uh, talked about um, the the same phenomenon in Israel and South Africa of promoting a discourse of liberalism, etc. While South South African um, sexual minorities experience severe violence, and I'd be curious to learn a bit more of that. So those are sort of my questions. Um, and we can open it up as well and take a few, and you can sort of pick and choose um, how to answer. So um, we'll take a question from you, and then you. So if, may I just say a few things? And then... um, let's start off with the questions, and then um, do, do comments. After, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, my question is for Rokin Yossi, kind of together. Um, uh, it, it feels as if also related to this question of um, whiteness vis a vis whiteness and masculinity, the ways in which whiteness and masculinity kind of go hand in hand. There's also a kind of running joke that my friend has made to me is why are you so beautiful? Because the, you're all mixed race and go to the of the army. So um, if you kind of, because there's also, if you look at the specifics of it, um, the comment you made about, you know, the, the Mizrahi's kind of taking over and there being a change, there seems to be a kind of a process of trying to create a, a very particular type of mixed race subject that has Western values, where it's not so much that they, you know, kind of more similar to Australia, I think things that happen in certain ways. And I was wondering about how the question of, of mixed or hybrid subjectivities with the questions of race and gender connected to those, what, what that kind of does for the arguments that you guys are making. So we'll take one more question and then so many questions all at once. We can, we can start, we can do answers and then do another round. Or? Go ahead, okay, last I'll, question. Because it does connect in, I hope, in some nice way. So uh, my question would be for Brooke, but I think it might also very possibly fold in some other things that Mark and Yossi also discussed. And I'm just really excited by your project, Brooke, and, um, and, and really excited by your analysis. And a, a question that's been on my mind lately is, has been kind of how did the reconstruction of a vigorous Israeli Jewish masculinity take place through specifically settler colonial practices in the early 20th century and maybe even before and after 1948, even before we get to the the, the validity that emerges around the occupation in 67. And so, and you invoke the Sagra Jew, which is exactly where my mind goes on this, but I feel very ignorant and like this is a new topic for me. So, you know, other than maybe Oz Alamog's work on the Sagra or other people who are trying to talk about that generation or the way that it was gendered, uh, where do you think we might want to go to talk about that? And just about the colonialism, like specifically about being able to bound, uh, occupy, and then uh, stand, and then remove, right? The evidence, as Yossi was invoking, the evidence of, of Arabness or, or right, uh, from the land so that it appears to be, in some sense, the leader of the Jewish. Thank you. Um, should we start yeah. responding? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I can start with that one. I know that we have a lot of questions, and, and so I don't know if people are jumping in, but 
Um, you know, for, for your question, Scott, and for your question, Mark, I think that both of them, for me, make me think that, um, to be honest, I've read a little bit, but I would have to do much more research to actually know what's going on on the ground in Palestine. I'm from the US, and really a lot of my work so far, so far, is just looking at this promotional discourse, right? This is the promotion of Zionism. It's it's not the actions. Um, and so, so I would say that like, I, I am, I definitely see what you're talking about with kind of producing these, this beautiful, tanned, Israeli, multicultural subject. And I feel like I would have a very different sense of that if I was there. Um, and I'm not. Um, but I, I see a little bit of that. And I think that the, Judaiza the Judaization of the land, and also I think, like my first thoughts would be like, well, we would have to go to like the Hebrew revival and the imposition of Hebrew and the shaming of Yiddish and the shaming of Arabic mm -hmm. and what that what that created and the shame around the Holocaust and the mis the treatment of Holocaust survivors actually and the notion of like mice into men in that era before sixty seven and then sixty seven being this promotional moment um, for Jews around the world where now we can have pride um, has been the, the typical thing to say so we could at least start there. I mean, I'm just gonna say, I mean, I don't know much about this, but I think the teal, like what I talked about, like hiking, sort of knowing to, like, um, learning the land is loving the land. And the idea that, like, creating the state of Israel, especially the first settlers that came, you know, these sort of weak European Jews, only by, like, by learning the land, by hiking, you know, like the hike on Masada, that was, that was part of the Zionist youth movement, and was later sort of reclaimed by birthright in this kind of creepy way, right? But that was, I think, sort of, you can see the sort of emerging ideas about masculinity in, or in, in that practice, too. Maybe, yeah. I'll, I'll let you question now, it's pretty similar, because I think they, in some way, have some kind of people that come back to their uh, Arab, Arab identity in different meaning. So speak up, a lot of my age start to learn and I start to learn Arabic and speak to read or something around it. A lot of people come back to the music, to the food, to some cultural stuff. I don't know if this come back to and come to be something with the Palestinian because the the walls, the mental walls, the build between the Jewish and Palestinian, they are really high and even more high than the wall they build. Mm. So it is problematic, but we have different uh, thinking and way of dealing with the Palestinian when they, this is a Jewish art and. Uh, I argue the uh, Arab Jewish, Jewish Arab uh, instead of Mizrahi because the Mizrahi in the beginning this come from the hating the old student what they call in the uh, in the Arab the, the Eastern yeah in Yiddish is old student the, the Eastern the Jewish from the East and they are all the uh, Haredi religious uh, uh, Hasidic the no one don't want and uh, all the scholars look on them as a primitive community and all what the violence will come. Uh, uh, this view is become to the all the Arab Jewish because of the Arab, the other the new Arabs. And now uh, I call them Arab Jewish because most of them from the Arab yeah. the, the country uh, and my grandfather called himself Arab Jewish first Tunisian after this Arab and just in the third part is Jewish. So this exists and has some part of this, and all the images speak on. I think this is just outside view because inside this society, when right, I look at this, I saw just Ashkenazi. I don't saw colors. This may be from outside look, like have some mix, with, but this is mostly really typical, typical people, people we call them. Kimmerlin Cohen, the Salim, the Ashkenazi, the Jewish from the countries, from the Muslims, this is the people that. Yeah. The settlers, the 
and in such a way that in the second hour, they call the meaning that we aim to the one identity, really specific identity, without the perform. And in some way, what you say, you restore the perform way. Mostly, this is the Zionism today. It's more perform than acting, it's not really like In some performance, like the picture of the Holocaust, they're not connected to the Jewish. Oh, and um, just also just to your question, I wanted to show you something, um, just a, a visual about the way before the 40, 48 and the early Zionist settlers that came um, completely imitated the the garb, the dress, and were kind of trying to imitate the the Arab farmers because they had no idea how to do any of this. And if I can get this thing to work, I can show you a picture of like the Hashomer uh, guards, which were the most uh, like militant uh, early Zionists. And all of their photos are taken in the Bedouin clothes and they were on horses and they just were watching and trying to imitate um, the Arabs. Uh, and that was for them Become returning to the biblical Jew. Um, so here, I will just show you a picture. Um, well, all, all the Hebrew things at the beginning, the settlers of Palestine, uh, one, uh, uh, one state solution in the beginning, until 47 they speak in the terms of which alone they call, all these people speak about one state to everyone. So, until 47 is. Does anybody else Okay, so uh, I could say just real quick that um, I think that Boyerman and also there's a uh, there's a short essay by Tamara Mayer called From Zero to Hero, Masculinity, in, I think it's Masculinity and Jewish Nationalism, but that's very much about the military, and I would think that in this early time we might see some debates around that, but there also, I would say, is a connection to, like you're saying, the hiking, German nationalism, frankly, Manifest Destiny, I think that a lot of it would look like a, a colonizing project, even with these imitative um, yeah, yeah. yeah, this is examples. It's kind of small, but you could have you original image. Or... Yeah, um, it's a small, it's a low quality image, but these are yeah. Jews. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, we'll take. Um, well, um, <laughs> just go across. Um, yeah, okay, you want to read or we'll start. <laughs> Start here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Aviva, I have a question for you that I think maybe can expand to the whole panel. Um, I would love to take a little bit of time to talk about how um, so birthright has has a lot has a lot at stake in terms of continuity. You mentioned, and so how does the I mean, there's a joke. The joke obviously is that like you send kids on birthright so they like eventually make Jewish babies, right? And so how does that um, project and agenda intersect with the assimilation of um, queer subjects into that realm because they're not thought of as necessarily the normative reproductive unit. Um, and then I think it, that also ties into the second question, which is sort of why exactly, and maybe Mark can speak to this, uh, but I'm sure all of you can, like why exactly it is that it became more, like that it became advantageous to um, have sexuality be that factor, gender identity and sexuality be the factor that sort of could um, transfer, whereas like, why like why did that, why did it become expedient to make that the factor that would be, that could allow sort of initiation into this realm of normative citizenship, where otherwise it's, but it's not otherwise part of the nation building project, right, in terms of generativity and in terms of reproduction. Um, so, you mean in Israel or in? In Israel, Israel yeah, in, in Israel, yeah. yeah. Um, let's take the rest. Do you want? You know, I have the exact same question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just, I'm really interested in your perspective on, on truth and birth rights because, I, you know, I think that especially like USY and BBYO, all of these um, like young Judea youth organizations here are really about, you know, you kind of use uh, hookup culture on your PowerPoint. Yeah. You didn't really talk about it. And I was interested in that because I think, yeah, all of these groups are about getting girls and boys who are Jewish together to hook up 
get married and have babies. And you know, when I was before I arrived at a certain point of consciousness, and I was birthright, regrettably, um, I remember my tour guides telling me that if I met my husband on birthright, I could, you know, Israel would pay for my wedding and my honeymoon in Israel. So I'm interested in yeah. like how that extends to pink washing. I know that Israel has a lot of, you know, has a lot of reproductive technological advances. So I'm, you know. I'm interested for your perspective on that. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad So um, the question is mainly for uh, both people, but because I think it relates to uh, the other talks as well. So we're talking about Zionism, but I am feeling that the main emphasis here, or the main focus of the presentation is actually uh, Zionism within the US and within America because you were talking about the representation that's made in California and then so these people live in America and I don't think they want to live it. And even both like, yes, they go on a trip to Israel, but I don't think that the main um, motivation here is to make people immigrate. I actually know that it's not. So, it's, so it has more to do with American Jewish attempts, specifically ethnocentric attempts, to consolidate the community within America. So on that, um, you know, Aviva, you know, these Belfide people would be your best friends if you want to eliminate, you know, the occupation and colonization of Palestine. Because these American Jews, all they want is to stay in America and just become more Jewish ethnically for their own interests. So if you could just talk about. Um, Zionism and also Jewish American ethnocentrism uh, in the context of specifically America and also maybe America as a settler colonial um, um, culture in general. My last question. Yeah, I agree with that completely, except that I want to give this local perspective. I think I was a birthright member in 1958. I want you to understand that birthright has predecessors going way, way back. And they had some of the same, surrounded by the same anxieties of intermarriage and assimilation. I identified entirely with Mark's statement that he had been in a, a Zionist education masquerading as a liberal Jewish one. I did too, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I'm very interested in kind of these predecessors, actually. I have a well, I'm doing a project on that. But to understand, is long, the long history of that. Um, I think that's really important. And for, for your project, I think that there is a context, a larger context, not that it's your responsibility to take it into account. But I'm thinking of post World War II, especially if you're looking at the diaspora, this masculinization, you know, of Judaism um, happened in a context of severe attacks on nonism, <laughs> on you know the the, the the dominant woman. As in, in this is in, in the US context after after World War II. So the consolidation of yes an ethnic identity but that's very gendered as well as racialized. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe I'll just try to answer them with this question. In terms of the long history of birthrights, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, I didn't go into sort of predecessors to birthright and kind of the other visits to, to Israel, like, yes, work visits, had a that has gave birthright. There are definitely were predecessors, but I think over time, the, their purpose has also shifted. I think free birthright as is now, like the organization birthright. Some of them were like a lot longer, like for a year or something. Some of them were for younger people, like under 18. And I think also maybe, I'm not totally sure, but my understanding is that at least some of them aimed for kids to make Aliyah, right? That was the aim, so especially the longer trips. You're totally right. Today, the aim of World Trade isn't for kids to make Aliyah. It's the yeah, for people. So I think it really is, to, it's important to look at the long history of World Trade, but I think it's also important to see that today's World Trade is sort of most um, established and sort of institutionalized and the broad space that, that and is, there's been before and that other past projects had different aims. In terms of like birthright being, um, you know, great, like your, your question about sort of birthright and the export politics. I mean, in some ways, yeah, I mean, birthright is focused on the crisis in the diaspora, but it, it, it's um, defined by a very specific kind of relationship between the diaspora. 
the Aspera and Birthright. I mean, Birthright says in its literature, like I put up, you know, that um, Israel is like, you know, important to diasporic identity. And whereas, like, before, you know, 48, or maybe, you know, 200 years ago, Israel was like an idea to the diaspora. It was like a religious idea. It was like a, you know, uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't meant to be a physical place. It was meant to be something like spiritual, right? A spiritual place. Um, obviously, today it's like a physical place. And the idea of birthright is that, you know, part of the, you can be a Jew in the diaspora, but part of being a Jew in the diaspora is loving Israel and supporting Israel. And uh, the point of birthright is both to create, um, for kids and Jewish youth to meet each other and to have an investment in their Jewish identity, but to have an investment in their Jewish identity is partially through, like, their devotion politically, financially, otherwise. Um, yeah, so Zionism. So, and, yeah, and then to start, um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's not, well... Oh, and then, well, the, the, the hookup culture one. Right, last one. Right. The hookup culture. Well, it's interesting, because I interviewed someone who was about to go on the gay birth right. So I haven't actually touched her day, so I didn't lose it. Use it. Well, something she said, she was like, yeah. I was like, so why don't you choose gay birth right over any other birth right? And I think a lot with a lot of us. She was like, oh, well, like, I don't have the straight one. Because, you know, the hookup culture. And, like, she was like, yeah, I know, it'd be, it'd be fun if I could, like, hook up with someone, you know. <laughs> I was speaking to another guy who did um, straight work, right? But with a bunch of queer friends. And they were like, oh my god, the female soldier was just so sexy. It's just like, okay. So I think that on the face of it, right? On the face of it, we, we would think that like work, right? That the gay work, right? Doesn't produce the, you know, because we don't like, produce children. But then at the same time, you know, if you look at more nationalist discourse, now it's possible for like, Gay subjects produce formative babies. And even whether you're in Israel, in Israel, you know, there are secondary black There's like a lot of really interesting work being done, like, you know, Israeli gays going to India, like, our own nation. And, you know, so they can, like, have, they can go to India and, like, use the womb of a woman of color, but still produce a Jewish baby, right? So I think, I guess, what I'm interested in is, like, you know, how how people are, how, you know, obviously, um, um, uh, obviously there's these really big tensions. But like, how do we interrogate them, and how do we like point out these sort of tensions and hypocrisies in ways that make queer Jews think about um, their sort of incomplete absorption of this kind of project, or like only absorption under under certain terms, only for certain bodies. Um, um, oh, the last thing I was going to say was just about Zionism uh, and and Israel too. I think it's really important that yeah, for women. And, too, to think about how the Israeli things in a lot of ways in a lot of ways destroyed uh yes we're planning oh it's the same response to your question, right? I think. It's like um the question of like is the diaspora being is the diaspora security because of is it a lack of faith in God or something, you know? Uh, but, yeah, yeah. I mean I don't know, I think that like you know there's this really long tradition there was a much longer tradition of sort of Yes, for expressions of Jewish identity, but like the Yiddish culture, and you know the um, many, many of the Yiddish culture that weren't Ashkenazi, and obviously like the existence of Israel has just has destroyed those, has destroyed the Yiddish culture, and totally uh, repressed other expressions of Yiddish identity that aren't And so I, um, I see, uh, like that's where I see the importance of sort of. Uh, Embracing the Jewish culture and other traditions. Um, and because Jewish identity wasn't religious for, you know, 200 years, some years before the state of Israel, and there's a long history of culture that we can be celebrating about Israelis or U.S. Jews trying to consolidate their ethnic identity, that um, I think it's just actually really useful to focus on Zionism and like acknowledge that Zionism affects um, all around the world, but has deep, deep effect in the United States. Um, and um, recently, the International Jewish Times sent or published a pamphlet that you can get free online. It's called Israel's Role in Worldwide Repression, and it's basically about complicity between um, Zionist leaders and all kinds of repressive regimes all over the world. I think that looking at that is really useful. Like what I was talking about today, looking at the gendering of Zionism is really useful because it's definitely not something that only affects or principally affects folks in Israel. Actually, I, I don't know the extent of that part. Um, 
I think that if you're looking at some of those questions, Judith Butler's new work is super useful because she's talking about what does it mean to be a Jew in diaspora and what is the meaning of that. Um, and also, one of the things that occurred to me just as an example of the way that Zionism has the effects here in the United States is that groups like Inside Women of Color Against Violence, but a lot of other um, radical feminist health organizations that have made statements of solidarity with Palestinian people have been severely disciplined financially, personally, by Zionism, right? By Zionism in the US. So looking at Zionism as a structure of racialized and structural control that's not necessarily about what's happening in the United States. So th there was a question that, that I would have shot at as well. And you wanted to know when and how it became advantageous to kind of use gender and sexuality as a way to sort of shoehorn people into some kind of homo-national, homo-national, homo homo-normative identity. And I suppose my answer to that is, is that, I mean, this isn't a deep answer, but I think it's important that I want to say it, because it's, it, it's, it's a critique I have of this conference, which is I think it is possible to overstate Pinkwashi. Now that doesn't mean Pinkwashi doesn't exist. We, we saw examples here of how it exists extraordinarily. I mean, of course it exists. Of course we, there's evidence that Brad Israel does its job. Um, South Africa is engaged in a rainbow washing process as well. Uh, it, South Africa is leading uh, an international conference next week together with Norway looking at how um, uh, sexual minorities can be defended within the United Nations. And that is a kind of rainbow washing of a whole lot of violence that happens to queer people back home. That is true, but that doesn't mean giving it to America is sort of standing on the temple mark. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, and Jacob Zuma stands up and makes the South African president stands up and makes a homophobic statement every year. Months, and then he's forced to retract because of the Constitution. So it's not the time, what, like we mustn't get seduced by this idea in our activism. Much as pink washing is important as a kind of rallying point, we mustn't get seduced by this idea that, this, that, 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 that bringing gays into the bargain, bringing queers into the bargain, is, like, is, a, is a, a significant part of state policies in countries like South Africa and Israel. Um, I think that's really important to remember. Um, and I think that a lot of this happens because of social change and because of activism. I mean, I mentioned it, and I think I'm correct, but I'm not a great historian of, of, of the Israeli LGBT movement. But basically, queer LGBT people in Israel established themselves as an important minority. So you then had to kind of go for the vote. It's not dissimilar to what happened in the United States. And, 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 that kind of social change precipitates uh, the kind of change of policy that has to happen. I don't think that's the whole story, but it's just a kind of cautionary note to this country. Okay. Um, for the moment, we'll take questions. Um, we have uh, about 15 minutes. So, um, one, two, three. So, accepting the truth of what all of you have said, I think there's one major historical fact that you're not addressing, which is that the single largest immigration to Israel was by anti-Zionist victims and survivors of the Holocaust, who were actually primarily not Zionist at all. That's why they didn't see it before. They were at the diaspora. And they primarily came to Israel because of the anti-Semitism of Europe and the United States, it wouldn't take them after the war. So, um, and obviously, um, the notion of a perpetual enemy is tied into the Holocaust history in Israel. But um, I think that a lot of the hyper-masculinity and the attempt to create sort of the new Jew comes out of the Holocaust, and and I don't hear what you're saying answering or explaining or taking into account that additional truth. It's not, it's not like what you said wasn't true. It's just that there's this other major piece that, and most people would say that but for that migration, 
you know, Palestine and Israel might be a very different place now than it is. Um, I have uh, a couple of things. The first one is just to ask uh, briefly why denounce birthright as opposed to birthright unplugged, which is already exists, exists, and so is there some dirt that we don't know about, or is there something going on? Yeah, like are they are they doing the same thing, or is there some kind of oppositional differences in the way that you're approaching uh, this? Thing? Uh, but the other, the larger question for me, and um, partly, um, and I would con contend, contest what you're saying because, in fact, the larger emigration, emigrations or immigration to Israel were of Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews, that the Arab Jews constitute a larger part of the population than the Ashkenazi Jews. But that there's a whole rewriting attempt to rewrite that history now, wherein um, the Arab Jews are being um, uh, rewritten as refugees, which they were not refugees. And there's a that works within the Zionist Holocaust narrative as well uh, to to re rework to then um, first of all it then becomes contentious for the Palestinian right of return then there's there has to be some kind of Jewish right of return in terms of Arab countries all of that so I was wondering if you know if what's happening in Israel about that because certainly in a larger international context there is some kind of foment around that. Um, and just um, just as a, an aside and a recommendation, there's a, a recent film out called They Were Promised the Sea, which is about uh, Moroccan Jews and the, uh, their Muslim neighbors who mourn their departure, but also how the, uh, the promise for uh, Arab Jews, Moroccans in this case specifically, was, uh, was um, was thwarted by, or, or you know, for, for those Jews, in fact, they were brought into a very different vision of what, what they thought they were coming to in Israel because of their mistreatment. Um, uh, so anyway, just to, yeah, the film is just recently out by Catholic Zahn. I think they need some funding too, so maybe look at their Indiegogo, they don't promise to see a compared to those production yet. Uh, no, it's no, she's, done. she's trying to distribute it. Oh, I don't know, I just saw that. Yeah, yeah, it was recent, it's, out. it's just, right. just finished. Yeah. yeah, so the one last question, if you can do it very brief, and then we'll do the final answer. Um, yeah, this is very brief, and remarkable for anyone. Just, um, this might be too brief a question. Is there a big discussion about the, the parallels of analogy between apartheid and Zionism in South Africa? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm assuming that. Um, and if there's any particular fear in law that that would be So, yeah, there's a big discussion. It's incredibly contentious. I'm not sure you really have to Richard Goldstone and Joseph Sides are contentious with you. Using the past of its time to describe the history of the Arab Jews in South Africa and the history of the Arab Jews in South Africa and the history of the Arab Jews in South Africa and the history of the Arab Jews in but that's because of the, I think the Jewish community's own um, real double face and its own complicity in the public. So, so in, in contemporary South Africa, you go to the Jewish Museum in, um, in Cape Town and you see this incredible wall of heroes, of all these struggle activists who happen to be Jewish. Joe Slover, Ruth Burst, Rusty Burstyn, and Rusty Burstyn. Wow, the Jews are so kind of sizzling. This is how they find it. But they were real outliers. <coughs> the Jewish community was, was very quiet, very complicit. And there, there's not a clear discourse. Um, uh, uh, there's not a specifically queer anti Zionist discourse or a queer less discourse or a queer pink question discourse. I, mean, I think it's worth some value in these outcomes. I think it's tough. Um, for birthright unplugs. No, no, no. There's no gates with birthright unplugs. But basically, birthright unplugs. I'm not sure if they're still active, actually. Because sure. uh, when I check their website, they're not. I, I'm in touch with a couple of people who used to run it. But they basically take kids who just done birthright into Palestine, into the West Bank. Um, so I think that's really important and valuable. Um, but I guess the angle I'm coming at it is from it, people shouldn't, shouldn't just 
not on birthright period. I, I think that like there's a big effort to sort of justify going on birthright for um, local reasons to be able to go to call sign. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we should sort of like, um, I think it's pointless to try to create divides about like what, what's about reason to go on birthright, but I think in, in general, it's sort of the idea of an on birthright is we're probably for the end and complete defunding of birthright as an institution. I'm sorry, I just want to add something. It, it, I, I, I honestly, didn't honestly have a question here. There's not a quid Jewish anti-pink Russians. There is something of, of a, a queer anti-pink Russian that's was made by Zaki Hachman, who is a, you know, a pioneer in many, um, in many political <laughs> Well, actually, I, I, uh, I just had a couple more questions. And, uh, and it has, again, to do with the birthright thing. And I, I, I kind of do wonder, since I'm not Jewish, um, it, it seems to me that the whole birthright movement is part of the, the concern that is an evident concern in, in, among the Japanese uh, in America and all that, that with assimilation comes the loss of identity and its roots. And I just wonder to what extent, without moving on the uh, successive generations of diasporic Jews couldn't care less about the nation of Israel. Yeah, but I, I guess what I was trying to talk about in my presentation, why I talked about sort of history is of like radical political Jewish activism in the diaspora, and also like the Bones, you know, groups like the Bones, but also looking at like, you know, like the Vada and the Kudab, right? There are all these other ways to express the you know, identity that have nothing to do with Zionism in Israel. But I also think, of course, birthright ties into like this, you know, work done on birthright, how birthright ties into larger sort of diasporic movements more broadly, you know? Whether it's like the Indian diaspora and how like loads of countries topple that fucking diaspora diaspora. You know, like diaspora tourism is huge, like African American diaspora tourism has to go back to your roots. Obviously the difference with Israel, which is why it's like, you know, the is that it's not our it's not really our roots for the vast majority of us, right? I mean the diaspora tourism for me would be going to like South Ukraine. Yeah. So I think that there's there's for me that tension is really Especially to the extent that it's not a religious uh, matter for a lot of uh, contemporary Jews. So if it's not, if, if, if it also is not a national matter, then what is it? Yeah. Jewishness, Jewishness, and I think that, that actually looking at, I mean, I know I've said it before, but Jews don't want to hear it, and it says a lot about that. What is the meaning of Jewishness, right? Um, what is I'm just uh, what you speak about the big immigration of anti Zionism. Most of the anti Zionism come to the United States, not to Israel. You see all the suffering, and most of them die. The, the biggest uh, immigration to Israel was after 48 from our countries. Most of them don't recognize us as refugees because of different. Uh, values and because the most of the reasons to countries don't want them is because of what the Israel do like in Egypt and all the bombing Morocco and other countries. So it's not it exists but it's not so uh, right and all the, the point of the uh, masculinity where we speak about Herzl and Freud, this was before the Holocaust. Yes. So it exists in the uh, thinking of the Latins and of the Latins. Thank you. Boyer, would say that the, um, that the Dreyfus trial affected Herzl, but not as much as the trial of Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. So that might be like the place to look for some of those. And I think that what you're talking about as well, we're talking about the Extreme, you know, the, the heteronormative West that's being imposed at Boyer and they call that a colonizing project, Jews as a as a colonized group in Europe, especially, um, being being submitted to the civilizing mission of Europe, which was gonna properly gender them. And that, that definitely precedes the Holocaust by by the long term. Yeah. 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 Y
But, I mean, also, just last note, not all of not all of the quote have designed that, even though I think that's not like totally. I mean, like there were there were bunch of members who were part of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, who survived the Holocaust, and then at the end refused to migrate to Israel. One of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Does anybody remember the name? Yeah. If you Google it, I'm sure you can But there's also a split in the Bund. I mean, it's this is a very complex dance history. It's not that important. But there was a split in the Bund in which, you know, there was a large migration of Bundists who did go to Israel. And, I mean, I think that this is sort of the integral point of Zionist history is that, you know, it's so fragmented, you know, that I think maybe to look at it, I mean, I think Brooke suggested this. Sort of earlier is that we, if we look at it rather than sort of going through these examples um, of the fragmentation, but rather kind of looking, <clears throat> you know what, I've totally lost my train of thought, but and I shouldn't have interrupted, so forgive me. But <laughs> um, I think what I was trying to, I think what I've been thinking about while you've all been, while you've all been talking, has been about this sort of like massive settler colonial project that I think Yossi stated from the very beginning. Um, sort of, you, you made three very distinct points, and you said, I speak about this, I speak about this, I speak about this, one being the settler colonial project, and I think it was you who, you were trying to point that out a little bit before, to talk about this as the sort of historical antecedents to what we're actually dealing with, you know? So every time we talk about birthright, we can look at it as a refraction of a massive settler colonial project that happened in 1898, you know? <laughs> um, and then, and subsequently and further. I don't know. I just sort of wanted to. Okay, we need to wrap up. Sorry. Um, so, thank you for your time.